Welcome, I'm Steve Winnick with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and we'll be here talking with Steve Riley, a great musician in the Cajun music genre, who performed a concert in our 2020 Homegrown at Home concert series. Hi, Steve, how are you? Great, good to be here with you. All right, it's great to see you. I don't know if you remember this, but the first time I interviewed you was 25 years ago for the folk music magazine Dirty Linen, uh, it was in Philadelphia. And we did a story about you way back then. And so we've actually met before long, long ago. So it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. I vaguely remember that. Yep. <laughs> it's, one, it's one of those one of those many things that happens in a lifetime of touring the country and the world uh, as you have. So I guess the first thing that we just want to do, just check up on how things are going there in South Louisiana with, uh, you know, with the pandemic and all that how how's everybody holding up well um music venues are shut down here for the most part there's a few venues that have maybe small duos or trios and um you know things that just at a at a point here in louisiana and around the country where um you gotta be really cautious you know this thing has not slowed down if anything it's taken off again yeah so uh you know Personally, I have been pretty hard quarantined since March and I'm um, lucky to just be able to do uh, Facebook live shows with my two boys, um, like the show we did for y'all. Thanks for That's having right. us. That was really special to um, be a part of that. And um, so we're, you know, just doing our part to stay safe and what we're supposed to do. We have a vulnerable member of the family, my wife. So mm -hmm. we have to be extra safe for her. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. And I, I hope you all keep safe. And the great thing is, as you say, with your two boys being such great musicians, you can still have a band going uh, and be in quarantine at the same time. Yeah, I tell you, if I didn't have them, I tell folks, I would, I think I'd kind of go crazy not to be able to play music with somebody for such an extended period of time um, would really take its toll, you know, and it, it still does in a way not to be able to play with my band and not to see people in front of us dancing. And, but <clears throat> I, I'm really grateful to have what I have. It's great. Yeah. So um, let's go back and talk about sort of some of that history with, uh, with your band, but I guess to begin, we can go all the way back and talk about your, your childhood and how you got into music, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I grew up in a small town called Mamou, Louisiana, which is in the center of uh, Prairie Cajun country, kind of south central Louisiana. And um, I grew up hearing Cajun music in my grandparents' home. Uh, I heard, you know, legends like Marc Savoy and uh, Dennis McGee on at one set of grandparents in Eunice. And in Mamou, <clears throat> I heard Cyprien Landrino. Mm hmm and uh, some of the great musicians around Mamou um, who had come to my grandfather's house. And my grandfather, Bert Guillory from Mamou, was involved in the cultural happenings like uh, the Mardi Gras run, the Mamou Cajun Festival. And he would always uh, bring me along with him to hear the music. And it's just been something I've, I've always loved. I heard the accordion for the first time when I was about three years old, mm -hmm. sitting on the floor of my grandparents' home in Eunice. And it was Mark Savoy playing and <clears throat> being the big guy he is and the big sound that he plays, I was immediately um, captivated and in love with the instrument and the rhythm and the sound and, and everything about it. So started young. Yeah, that's great. And, um, and so within your family, there were musicians as well, right? Yeah, Mark is my second cousin, his mm -hmm. mother and my grandmother. Um, were sisters on my dad's side of the family and um, my dad plays uh, classical piano and he used to play a little accordion as well. Mm -hmm. um, my great uncle on my mom's side is the one who taught me my first song on the accordion. So yeah, I mean in the family, in the community, music was everywhere. Yeah. And somehow <laughs> you, you hooked up early on with uh, with Dewey Balfa. Explain, explain how that happened. Yeah. Um, my grandfather, Burke, who was my biggest influence as a child, passed away when I was seven. 
and um, when he passed away, I, I my interest in the music kind of went away as well. Um, I was closer to him than I was to my parents or to anyone else, so it was really hard on me <clears throat> for a long time. But he left me his record collection, and in that record collection was a couple of records by the, the Balfour Brothers, and one had Mark Savoy on accordion, and I put that record on, and it just moved me. I was about 12 years old when I put that record on. I told my mom, I said, look, I want to play this music. I want an accordion for my 13th birthday if you can make it happen. And uh, so um, music just kind of saved me. It brought me out of a, you know, a depression that I was in for many years after my grandfather's death. And I got my first little cheap accordion at age 13 from Mark Savoy's store. And I had all these tunes in my head that I learned from my grandfather. I learned how to sing them. I remembered them. On the way back from Eunice to Mamu, which is about 15 minutes, I figured out about three tunes. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So was that, was that, that, uh, that yellow co colored album of the, of the Balfour brothers that. Yeah. Well, um, that I remember the records were different colors. Oh the yeah, ones I had. There was Might a brown one. Yeah. There was a brown one called the Balfour Brothers play more traditional uh -huh. Cajun music, and that's the one that had Mark on it. Yeah, that's that, those were some great albums. I've spent a lot of time listening to those as well, just because you know I, one of the things that that I think a, a lot of people appreciate about your bands is your focus on some of the traditional music as opposed to uh, always doing new songwriting, both of which are great, of course, but you have that, that rootedness in the community that, that Dewey uh, kind of instilled in you. Um, so, uh, so explain his influence on you. Well, um, I loved his music so much um, that I tried to just emulate every note he played and the way he sang and when i finally met him when i was 15 years old at a party at his nephew tony's house and we played together he said steve he said i'm really um grateful that you like my music so much he said but you sound more like me than i sound like me he said <laughs> you need to find your own voice you know and your own way of expressing yourself and <clears throat> that's just one of the many things he's told me over the years that have stuck with me and um, I, I understood what he meant, you know, and um, I started to just kind of do what he told me, you know, and it wasn't long after I met him, I started playing music with him. I knew his whole repertoire, so musically we got along great mm -hmm. and um, started listening to other Cajun musicians as well, a little more and all of their styles and uh, vocally and instrumentally started making their way into my conscious and my my way of playing, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in addition to accordion, you also do play uh, fiddle and guitar and other things. Did you, did you pick those all up in that sort of period when you were in your teens and starting to really branch out? I did. There wasn't a whole lot to do in Mamu um, other than, you know, and get into trouble. Luckily, I just, uh, you know, get into small town, small time trouble. So luckily, I, I had music, the music that I was into, a lot of great musicians I could spend time with, uh, Dewey and the Ardwan family, Boisek Ardwan, those guys lived in Mamu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I also started playing tennis around that time. So music and tennis is what I did as a teenager. <laughs> That's great. So uh, you also hooked up, <clears throat> and, and around that time, uh, with uh, with David Greeley, uh, and that kind of you know charted a course for you a little bit later on. So talk about meeting David and, and other folks in that little orbit that Dewey created. Um, I met David when I was eighteen. I just moved to Baton Rouge to go to LSU, and he had just moved back to Baton Rouge, um, Denham Springs right outside of Baton Rouge, which is hometown. Mm -hmm. He had just moved back there. And uh, we met at a jam session in Mark Savoy's store. And uh, 
hit it off and exchanged numbers and started hanging around in Baton Rouge playing music together. He would play a lot of solo gigs at restaurants and different places, and I'd go join him. And, uh, you know, our friendship just grew really quickly. And I think I met him in the uh, summer of 87, and by early 88, we had started the Mamu Playboys. Mm -hmm. And how did, <clears throat> how did that come together at first, the band? Well, he was playing um, lunch at Mulot's in Baton Rouge, Mulot's Cajun Restaurant. And um, the owner, um, I, I would go sit in with him a lot. And the owner asked us, um, when he asked David, he said, uh, you think you could put together a band maybe with Steve? David was old, he's 15 years older than I am. And um, he said, do you think you put a band together maybe with Steve on Monday nights? And David is like, sure. And so he put together a couple of guys, a drummer and a guitar player, and it was me and David. And um, the two guys he got were really nice guys, but they really were not up to par. <laughs> and so I said, uh, you know, David and I talked after. I said, you know, you mind if I get two other guys for next week and see how if that works out any better? And he was nice enough to let me get a couple of guys I knew from Mamu. And... Um, it was a lot better, and since there were three of us in the band from Mamu, couldn't think of another name, so we uh, came up with the Mamu Playboys. All right, and there there was an earlier band called the Mamu Playboys, right? There was, and our early our first guitar player Kevin Berza, his father and grandfather, Florence and Maurice, um, were the original Mamu Playboys. Right, cool. and so I did have to ask Florence who was the drummer in Dewey's band at the time. And I was playing with Dewey since age 15. So Varnes and I were pretty tight. And I said, hey, Mr. Varnes, I'm about to start this new band. Do you mind if I, you know, continue or bring back the name to Mamu Playboys? And he was good with it and said, just, you know, respect the music and, and do right by, by that. And it's all yours. All right. So how did you decide to go from being like a, a restaurant and and dance floor band to doing recordings and putting together a song repertoire and all that kind of stuff that you have to do uh, to be a touring band. Well, um, things just kind of started rolling really quickly. We were one of the only young bands at the time playing traditional music and uh, a lot of people knew who I was from playing with Dewey for a few years. And, you know, we did the restaurant circuit in the, which was big in those days, late eighties, mid eighties and the early nineties. And we, you know, were doing a lot of festivals, Dewey and I, that is. And the Playboys just kind of, um, got a, we, uh, got a good name for ourselves and a lot of recognition early on just from um, playing the same places I was playing with Dewey and being, like I said, one of the only traditional Cajun bands singing all in Cajun French. And, um, I mean, thinking back to uh, when we first started, I mean, I think we did our first record um, very early on, maybe in, 1989 and uh, we recorded it in Zachary Richard's garage studio and Zachary mm -hmm. produced this and um, it got a lot of attention you know I mean honestly when I was I was about 18 19 I was just into um, playing music and having a good time I wasn't thinking about recording records even you know thank God David was a little older and you know kind of directed me because I was a, uh, was a hot mess, you know, <laughs> late, late teens, early twenties. Sure. <clears throat> so, very thankful to him for kind of making think things happen early on. Round the Records approached us after one of our sets at Festival Zacadien in Lafayette, and uh, you know, wanted us to record for them. So, things happen really fast. Yeah. And you'd been going to that festival for a long time, right? Festival Zacadien was a was a, 
a big thing. I mean, in, in, Oh yeah. I start. that was, um, I would go there every year from age 13 and watch Dewey and his band play and other guys play. And, uh, you know, it was always a dream of mine to play there. And, um, I was 18 the first time the Playboys played there. I think I was 17 the first time I played with Dewey. And, um, I mean, that festival more than any other highlights our culture, our language, and who we are as a people. Very special festival. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because there's, there's that famous picture that Philip Gould took of you as a, as a kid. You were maybe 14 years old at the festival in the audience. And yeah. then he took another picture a few years later where you're on stage and there's another kid in the audience looking up at you the same way you were looking up in the, in the first picture. So, yep. um, and I'm, kinda, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I was watching Dewey. Pretty yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and I mean, it's great that now, of course, you've got your own kids that you're, that you, that you're working with. And, and it's another way of, uh, of moving that tradition on. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them in a minute, but I want to talk a little more about the, the Playboys just because, I mean, you, the, the band had kind of a, a, a niche. I, I remember you said, you know, you were one of the only young bands. And I, I do remember people talking about you in those days as not only being a young band, but being kind of traditionalists and yet young, that that was something that really stood out for a lot of people. Um, so I guess one of the questions is, you know, you were you did put together a, a kind of traditional repertoire. Where did you go for, for the music? Where did you who, who, who did you consult? What places did you look? That kind of thing. Well, my primary vision for the band was to play um, the music of my biggest heroes, who were um, the Balfour Brothers and uh, Mark and Ann Savoy, mainly, you know, yeah. and uh, some stuff by Lawrence Walker. Just, you know, a band <clears throat> that would play uh, the tunes I loved from um musicians i loved you know i mean it was really wasn't anything complicated david however um had a uh a big um what's the word i want to use he had a uh big interest in older music that was archived and he um found a lot of great tunes that i had never heard and uh brought them to the band and we recorded a lot of them. Uh, they were really obscure. What the Playboys have always done is taken old material and uh, made it our own. You know, I mean, I was telling someone the other day, all of our songs, even the traditional stuff that we do from other folks is uh, just treated in the way, in, in our own way, you know, whether we add harmony vocals or arrangements or modulations or, um, different instrumentation, you know, over the years, you know, although we started as a band that emulated our heroes, it changed, you know, we started writing our own tunes and um, just started, um, our style got very cohesive and, you know, like bands that play together a lot, like, like that, like they do, you know, that happens. And, um, you know, I guess we always had a recognizable style because of that. Even in the early days, we sang a lot of harmony. You know, we didn't write yeah. our own material on the first couple of records, but we played a lot of songs that uh, people, you know, that hadn't been recorded very much. And, uh, you know, it, it put us on the map. You know, it was amazing back then. People hear you song on the radio and... Um, you know, it could really move things forward really fast. I guess that's kind of the way it is today as well. But <clears throat> it just seems like things happened so fast in the young days for us, in the early days. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were, you know, you were doing great stuff. Those those records still hold up today. You can listen to them and, you know. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So. We still get orders for them. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, you had mentioned... Um, the Ardwan family living nearby, and uh, just as as you may know, we had Sean in the same series as you, and we just did the oral history with him a couple days ago, actually. Um, and one of the things that kind of comes up in in talking with Creole musicians is this whole issue of 
that line between the Cajun tradition and the Creole tradition and what, you know, how, how different people define that. Um, what, what's your take on that, uh, on, on the whole Creole, Zydeco, Cajun music constellation? Well, in a lot of ways, I think we're one big family here. You know, we borrow a lot from one another stylistically, song-wise. And um, it's been that way since the Cajuns got here and met up with the Creoles, you know, the exchange of musical ideas and uh, cooking ideas and yeah. just uh, ideas about life in general, you know. I mean, we are, we have been together here a long time and I consider them family, you know. Some of the musicians I've spoken to the most since this pandemic started are uh, uh, Creole musicians like Curly Taylor, uh, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, Keith Frank calls me on a regular basis because he's pretty hard quarantined himself. And, um, you know, I've, I've borrowed some stuff from those guys and, and vice versa, you know, mm -hmm. tunes and styling ideas and good stuff yeah well one thing that was really interesting uh that you had on a couple of your albums it was now now many years ago but it's still i think a real a really interesting couple of pieces was two songs that had been that you know you you guys put together out of poems that were written down in a book uh by a by a creole slave um back in the 19th century um do you remember those songs i mean do you, do you ever sing them still or like vini gili was one of them um yeah and grosjean maybe yeah yeah and so, there's a few of these poems that were in a book i think sam broussard our guitar player i think his uncle right had had something to do with this book i can't remember right now um but it was a slave named pierre who learned to read and write somehow um and he wrote these poems that were really powerful and we turned them into music. And, uh, you know, that's a uh, pretty um, great thing to be able to do, you know, and to be able to find. So yeah, those, those kind of treasures are still coming to us, but it's like an endless archive over here, you know, it just new stuff like that just keeps making its way to the surface. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing that's true about any band, I think, and, and certainly the Mamo Playboys is that things go a little bit in cycles. So you have a while when you're doing, you know, mostly older traditional stuff, and then you'll do a, a record that's more sort of dance hall based and some that have more of your own songs. And even that works in terms of the languages. You're doing more, more English sometimes, almost always, almost all French other times. Is there is there a pattern to that or is it just you're doing whatever feels right at the moment? It's just whatever feels right at the moment, really. You know, we um, we always, you know, I'll, I've always thought of albums as a snapshot of where the band is at that yeah. moment. <clears throat> but um, we've made a lot of records, maybe 15 or 16 records in our this is our 33rd year to, together. So um, I really feel like in the past 10 years that we have figured out finally in the past 10 years what really works and what we're really good at. And we're really good at zoning in on that and making that happen. In the studio, you know, we're good at using studio um, as a tool to try out, experiment with a few things, mm -hmm. and always have uh, good engineers and sometimes interesting producers like C.C. Adcock, who produced a couple of our records. But, um, you know, it's, it's always a pretty organic process as far as the songwriting, bringing it to the band, it turns into what it turns into, and finding old material still. And, um, you know, we always include a mix of the old stuff and the new stuff and mm -hmm. most of it is is danceable and uh you know a lot of our gigs are the dancers and yeah. you know we're in south louisiana festivals and dance halls you know 
big old dance halls with a big wooden floor with couples just going in a circle and little waltzes and two steps and beautiful thing. Yeah. So where where do you go nowadays to find the old songs? You say they're 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 still out there and they're always coming to you, but where where do you look? Well, um, a lot of times those songs just come to me like friends of mine will say, "Hey, have you ever heard this?" Mm -hmm. Or you know, yeah, just that kind of thing. Or there's an actual an arc an archive here at UL University yeah. um, that has an incredible collection of old stuff. I mean, and I have people calling me saying, Steve, I just found these old reel to reel tapes in my attic of the Balfour brothers from the seventies. Um, what should I do with them? Well, bring them to my house immediately. <laughs> you know, sure. I, I want to hear what's going on. And, um, you know, I usually turn that stuff over to the archives before I even touch it really. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause those old reel to reels that people are finding in their attics are probably in pretty rough shape and need to be yeah. digitized and, you know, cleaned up um, before you throw them on a machine and listen to them, you know? <clears throat> yeah, we've so, got a lot of those too, yeah. They just come in all kinds of ways. You know, some of my guys uh, in the band, you know, we'll just be riding around and they'll say, hey, you ever heard this song? My drummer's dad was a great songwriter and uh, recorded some of his tunes um, years ago and we recorded them, re-recorded them. Uh, uh they just make their way to us and all over the place. And yeah. <laughs> in all kind of ways. Yeah. Well, another name that I've seen a lot uh, on your albums, you know, helps you a lot with the liner notes and stuff, is someone that we've worked with, too, and that's Barry Jean Ancelay. Um, talk about his influence a little bit. Barry's been a, a great friend for many years. Um, you know, I, I've been knowing him since... I was in my early teens and you know he always kind of has his finger on the pulse of what's going on down here with the young bands and it's one of the reasons we played festival of Cadian so early and it's his baby that festival he started it in the 70s and um he's the guy i go to to help me out with french lyrics because he's such a master of the language and uh you know, I could go on and on about Barry, uh, how much he's helped us. And, you know, he's just, he's just a, a good guy to know. He has a lot of knowledge about the music and, and the folks who made it. He spent so much time with them. And, you know, I'm thankful to, to have his friendship and his knowledge when I need it. Yeah, he's a he's a, a great person to consult on anything to do with Cajun music, but also the whole culture. He's 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 the real deal. So I wanted, wanted to make sure we we brought him up a little bit too. But so we're talking about the history of the band, and and one thing to mention that's always fun is that you guys did have four Grammy nominations over the years. Uh, that's something to be proud of, and and. Uh, a lot of other awards and honors that you've had uh, as just sort of a, a group at the forefront of Cajun music. But one thing that's interesting is you did win a Grammy Award, just not with uh, the Mamu Playboys. And so let's talk about some of the other uh, groups that you've played with over the years or other um, projects that you had, including that one, which is Courbouillon. <clears throat> Courbouillon. Coubillon, is that how you say Coubillon. it? All right. All right. Yeah. Coubillon, um, this band, it's Wayne Toops, mm -hmm. um, who's a well-known accordionist here, who um, kind of burst onto the scene in a huge way in the late 80s with his, uh, he called it side Cajun style, and uh, he just really rocked up the rhythm section and... Uh, he was, he looked like a rock and roller and approached yeah. it all like a rock and roller, a great singer, soulful voice. And um, he really got a lot of young folks interested into the music with what he did um, to it. And <clears throat> Wilson Savoy is the other member of the band. And uh, he's the youngest guy 
he's it's like uh, three generations of, uh, of accordion players and band leaders. And Wilson is the son, youngest son of Mark Savoy, who plays accordion and fiddle. Um, and uh, yeah, the the way this band started is uh, you know it's, it's in a simple. Uh, loose way and that's the way this band has approached everything it's done from the recording to playing the shows it, it started in a bar one night wayne and wilson were in a bar and, and wayne said hey we need to start a band and uh you're gonna play fiddle and we're gonna get steve Ryle to play guitar wilson said really are you serious about that he said yeah let's do it he said we're gonna call the band kubion well wayne had the whole the whole thing planned out <laughs> and so we played a little show at Cafe Des Amis in Bro Bridge on a Wednesday night, and they had music, um, smaller acoustic groups. They had music from seven to nine. The place was packed, and we didn't stop until 11.30. Wow. I mean, and the owner and everybody was loving it so much, they just let us keep going. The next time we got together, was in a studio, and we just sat down in a circle, passed around a bottle of whiskey, changed instruments, and played and made the record. Easiest record I've ever made. <laughs> Never would have thought it would have won a Grammy Award, but it did. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, congratulations on the Grammy. And that's also a really fun album. Great to listen to. So, yeah, so you, you all did a great job on that. Even if it wasn't, you know, uh, thought out maybe as much as some of the, the Mamu Playboys albums. Yeah, all the hard work. <laughs> We put yeah. it in as far as production and writing songs. And I tell you, this could be on record. And it just comes across like that, just loose and easy, and it just feels good, you know? And Yeah. Um, three generations of accordion players coming together. I guess it had what it, it needed to, <laughs> to bring home the goods. Yeah, great record. And uh, there's another group that you were, that you did that sort of touches on that, uh, that sort of older style of music, the group La Cine. Uh Talk a little about that project. Um, that group came together one winter. Um, I was uh, with, I was still with my daughter's mom, and she's the mother to Chris Stafford, mm -hmm. who is uh, the, the leader, is one of the leaders for the band Fou Follet, young band, a generation younger than I am <clears throat> and um he was getting really good on guitar I mean really good really quickly he got a new Martin guitar it was the winter time we weren't playing many gigs and uh I'd also heard a cassette tape of Mitch Reed and Kevin Wimmer playing Dennis McGee tunes together just on two fiddles that just blew me away and so um you know I said I talked to them first. I talked to Mitch and Kevin to see if they'd want to play because Mitch plays bass as well. And I figured he could um, double on those instruments, you know, play bass when we needed him to play bass and do the stuff with Kevin on fiddle. Yeah. And uh, of course, Christopher was into it. He was kind of nervous, but uh, he was into it because he was a lot younger than us. And um, we got Glenn Fields on drums from the, the Revelers. And uh, we, we decided to go with Glenn because we were going to do a lot of different styles from swaying to uh, Creole, Cajun, and uh, he was a pretty versatile drummer. So we figured he could handle it and um, started playing at the Blue Moon Saloon um, here in Lafayette, which was a happening place. It was just taken off and it was the place to go to. Um, at that time, so we got some good crowds and some good attention pretty quickly, and uh, it was always fun, you know, to just highlight, uh, you know, all the, the Creole tunes that Kevin Wimmer brought to the table. Mm -hmm. um, he's always been a, a student of that kind of stuff, you know, he's close with the Frank family, and uh loves to sing and, and play Creole tunes. So that band did a lot of that. We did a lot of just extend, we would take those songs and extend them and make them jam tunes. You know, it was really fun to do that. And 
and Mitch, we'd always break it down to Mitch and Kevin doing their twin fiddle thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still get together. We played maybe a year, a little over a year, a year and a half ago at the, uh, at a folk festival, at a state folk festival. I can't remember right now. Might have been, the, no, it wasn't the national. It might have been in Virginia or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still get together when we can and yeah. enjoy playing with one another. And then on the sort of opposite spectrum, you also had a sort of more high energy, like modern band, uh, which was high performance. So. <laughs> Yeah, that was um, Kevin Duga, who's the drummer in the Mamu Playboys. That was his idea. Those, you know, mostly guys he wanted to play with and just play that straightforward pedal to the metal dance hall sound from the first note to the last note, man. Right. It's just bam, you know, and people loved it. Steel guitar, driving steel guitar, uh, two fiddles playing harmony. And uh, me and one of the fiddle players switch off on accordion and fiddle because he's a great accordion player as well jason bajeron whose dad vernon played with aldous roger played drums with aldous right. roger so uh a lot of great young talent jamie beer is one of the best cajun singers you'll ever hear big smooth voice um and you know we uh we get some good crowds at dance halls and, and, and festivals for sure and another band, I don't know if you're going to mention this band or not, but I'll, I'll mention it. Bring it up, sure. <laughs> the, little, the Little Band of Gold, uh -huh. which was a band that sure. CC Adcock and I started. And it was a swamp pop band with Warren Storm on drums and vocals. David Egan was a great pianist and songwriter here. He wrote songs for Joe Cocker and Irma Thomas and Percy Sledge and a lot of, you know, brought, brought us some great tunes. Um, Dickie Landry and Pat Bro on saxophones and uh, Richard Como, who plays steel with high performance. He was on steel guitar with Little Band of Gold. And uh, we did some, we, we toured and opened up for Robert Plant on the southern leg of his, uh, of his tour. Nice. Um, with the, I uh, can't remember the name of his group that he was with, but um he also, we also recorded with him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> that band was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. All right. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it. And, you know, while, while you're mentioning that, uh, our, our viewers might not be fully aware of what Swamp Pop actually is. So if you want to explain <laughs> the music a little bit, that might be good too. Swamp Pop is, um, basically Cajun meets rock and roll. And, uh, when I say rock and roll, it's mostly old rock and roll, like Fats Domino era, era rock and roll. And um, like <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the ballads like Matilda, mm -hmm. you know, is that, is that a six, eight beat? You know, the uh, that kind of thing for the ballads and, uh, you know, the old rockers like uh, Chuck Berry style, rock and roll, Fats Domino with an accordion. Right. <laughs> so, like I said, you know, it's Cajun music meets 50s rock and roll in a lot of ways. That's what it is. And we also um, had a lot of original tunes in that band as well. Uh, David Egan was a great songwriter, C.C. Adcock, and we took a lot of, or a few of the old Cajun songs like Pali Nous Bois, which is mm -hmm. a Balfour Brothers song, and we rocked that up pretty good. And uh, we took an old waltz called the Evangeline Waltz and made it the Evangeline Waltz two-step, or Evangeline Rock is what we call uh -huh. it. And uh, so we just, you know, used all this rich gumbo of sounds we have here and... Um, Put it all together in that band, and it was a good run. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing we haven't talked about much yet is is that uh, in addition to looking for traditional songs and finding stuff within the community, 
you you've done some songwriting yourself so talk about that that process and how you started to integrate your own songs into the the bands that you play with um when i started writing tunes i would write a melody on the accordion or on the guitar and um i would bring it to david and he would write the lyrics so the first couple of tunes i wrote were like that and yeah um uh, I was always kind of shy early on about bringing ideas to the band, but eventually got over that and, you know, written some things in English, some in French, and just uh, however they come, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Sometimes the lyrics come, sometimes um rhythmic idea sometimes it comes to me on the guitar i wrote a song one of the last songs i wrote was a song called freetown freetown is a neighborhood here in lafayette and it has an amazing history because one of the one of the governors from years ago in the late 1800s alexander mouton mm -hmm. alexander mouton had an estate in in freetown um lafayette and he freed most of his slaves and allowed them to work for their own land and their own money. And that was very early on, you know, before, might have been before the Civil War even happened, or maybe right after it. Mm -hmm. So every, all these um, folks heard about Freetown and came from all over, you know, to, to live there, and he protected them. And uh, I was reading an article about it and just came up with this rocking kind of rocking lick on the guitar and uh, just wrote a tune about free child. Yeah. All French, right. and, French and English. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, how does that happen? How do you decide if, if a song is going to be in French or, or English or is it just however it comes to you? However it comes to me and however it... Uh, plays out you know mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't work at all in English you know the French language works the rhythm of it works really well I find um, with our music and you can't always get that from English right. um, it just so happened this last tune I was able to make some of the English lyrics work just um, it helps people to understand what the tune is about right there in real time instead of having to get the record and read the liner notes and the yeah. translations. And I'm not always about making it easy for people, but it worked for that song. Sure. All right. So uh, we talked at the beginning about uh, the fact that you're still able to play music now because you've got such a great musical family. Um, so let's talk about Burke and Dulce and how they started to learn music and, and you know, what, what, what that process was for the family. Well, they learned from a, an early age, if they didn't play music, they wouldn't get to eat in this household. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, Burke started out on a little drum set that was, I, I went to pick up my daughter at her mom's and uh, her mom said, take these drums out of my house. I don't care what you do with them. So we, we, Katie and I, my wife, lived in a little house in Bro Bridge, and Burke was a little baby. We put him in the living room. That's the only place we had for him. <laughs> so, so we put him in the living room, and I came home one day, and Burke was just pounding on a snare drum. And um, Katie was just besides herself. She'd had enough. I said, she said, get him off of those drums. I said, wait a minute. Listen to that. He's just hitting that drum in perfect timing. <laughs> She said, I don't care, just get him off the drum. So I started working with him, and before long, he was playing the trap kit. I mean, there are videos. He has played, I think he started playing, how old was Burke when he started playing on stage? Two years old, he was playing a little tiny man. trap kit on stage. Perfect timing, he had it, man. That's hard he to would, believe. And he was sitting with the Playboys, and we'd do what I say. He would do that, I mean, from Ray Charles, he had that rhythm down with the tom. Yeah. I was five years old doing that. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, as soon as he could hold one of my accordions, we had a music room. Um, when we moved from Bro Bridge, we moved to Jennings, and I rented this 
little music room where we hang out every day with mm-hmm. all our instruments. Um, I mean, I have a lot of instruments. I have so many instruments, I have to rent a different space for them. <laughs> and uh, we're actually building, I'm looking at a construction right now, we're building a rec room so I can store them. Good plan. Because there's too many in the house. There's too many in the house. And um, anyway, it gives me something to do to build uh, something for the family during sure. this time, you know. But uh, Burke started playing accordion and uh, it was a natural. He was just a natural on the accordion as well. And uh, the guitar came pretty easy. And uh, my youngest boy, Dozy, who's eight, uh, I would do a little kids camp here at my house. And so all these young kids would come over and they'd all just be learning accordion, fiddle, guitar, vocals. And Dozy just got into that routine and once the camp was over he still wanted to learn so um he can play a little guitar and some accordion and drums himself so mm-hmm. we uh yeah we just when when the shut when the, everything shut down in march we panicked here you know because our, our, our dates were just going away you know by, by the dozen you know just you know they went Everything till May canceled, and everything thing till September, then everything for the rest of 2020. Yeah, and so we were like, How are we gonna, what are we gonna do? You know, how are we gonna pay our bills? And um, a few friends started doing Facebook live shows, and we decided to try it. And it was the reception was just fantastic, you know, it was kind of rough at the beginning. We did a lot of rehearsals every day just to get you know, a little one hour set under our belts and, you know, now, uh, not even a year later, Burke is, is uh, coming up with his own vocal harmony parts and telling me, look, you know, what you're saying and what you're saying in that isn't working. So I, right. I just, <laughs> right. your part, your part doesn't really work. So let me just figure it out. And so, um, it's beautiful to, see them growing musically growing physically um and uh emotionally as well you know it, it's a tough time but it's still in a lot of ways uh really a blessing to be able to spend that much time with them teaching them music and uh teaching them how to to be good family members yeah it's a definite silver lining uh there to the whole situation is uh having that that family time yeah so so steve i just want to thank you one more time for not only the the great concert video that you did but for sitting down with us for this interview and uh, also uh just convey our thanks to burke and dolsey for the concert and also for going back inside and letting you finish up i know they're eager to get back outside it's a beautiful day here i hope it is there too it is beautiful All right. Well, thanks once again. And it's always good to see you. Thank you so much for having us um, as a part of the concert series and uh, uh, being with us today. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Steve.